commands us to do as we come before the Lord. It's part of the regulative principle that we'll talk about uh, today. But I just want to come today and thank you for your faithfulness uh, to the work of Christ uh, through your stewardship and through your giving. This has been a very difficult year, and I know that you know, all know that. Uh, but how God has been faithful through your kindness and through your goodness in serving the Lord in the area of finances. We had asked this month for $150,000, and that was a, a, a large step of faith to ask for that. Um, and Sue sent me a text uh, yesterday afternoon, and so I wrote this down. Uh, we received $161,000. Uh, $627. So um, the Lord blessed in a very unusual way, and I don't just want to thank you for your faithfulness. And I wrote this note, Sue jotted this down. Uh, Evangel is always ended in the black. Uh, this is Sue. But this is the first time as a financial secretary in her memory uh, that with the annual budget, uh, not necessarily the specific expenditures, but with the budget itself, uh, we have exceeded that at year end, and our budget was uh, 1,145,850, and we received 1,156,704, and so we give the Lord all glory and praise for his provision uh, for our body, particularly during this difficult time uh, at Evangel. And so let's pray together. Father, we thank you for uh, the gospel. Lord, we confess uh, that you have saved us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And Lord, we acknowledge that before you came to us and before you searched us out, before you found us, we were running from you. And Lord, quite honestly, we wanted to have nothing to do with you. And yet you came after us in your love. You gave your Son on our behalf and you sent your Holy Spirit personally into our life and made known to us the gospel of Christ and called us to yourself. You truly brought us out of death into life. And Lord, we thank you that through that gospel you have called us to serve you in this life. And Lord, we thank you that you take our lives, that you take our hearts, that you take our minds, and Lord, you take the giving of our hands, our tithes and offerings and gifts, and you use those things, you multiply them, and you do eternal work with them. And we can never glorify you enough for all you have done. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Spirit moves. 
Hope you're doing well and hope you had a very good uh, celebration of the Lord's birth. And for Sally and I, it was a wonderful time of visiting with uh, her parents. We were able to actually to see them and also to be, of course, with our grandchildren. It's wonderful to see your grandchildren. It's wonderful to come home. We love our grandchildren. Now, as I do want to look back for a moment and say that um, I want to thank the choir and the orchestra, and I want to thank Connie for the blessing of this past Christmas season. This, of course, is very difficult to do a lot of music, but uh, God just really blessed through them, and we want to thank you for that. Those of you who are in the orchestra, those of you who are in the choir, thank you uh, for the music that we had during the Christmas season also want to thank the ladies who were so nice to uh, beautify our church during the Christmas season. We thank you so much uh, for that and just the way that all of it brings glory uh, to the Lord. I want to thank David for preaching last Sunday and want to ask you to be praying for David. Uh, he, he has COVID and has lost his sense of taste and uh, is having uh, some, of course, the troubles that go with that. So please be praying for David and his his rapid recovery from the virus. I want to invite you today to turn with me to uh, a passage on worship, and I'll mention in a few moments why we'll be looking at worship, but if you'll turn with me to John chapter 4, John chapter 4, and I'll be reading verses 7 through 24. We're going to be focusing specifically on verses 19 through 24 today as we look at think about worship, so I invite you to stand with me as we read God's holy and inerrant word. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 and down through verse 24. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, and therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? since I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do we get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. The water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit 
and truth. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you and we ask, O oh Lord, that you would be pleased today to be in our midst. You have promised in your word that where two or three are gathered, that you are there in their midst. And so, Lord, we have come together in obedience to your word to gather before your throne of grace and to seek to praise your holy name. And we ask, O oh God, that you would pour out your spirit upon us. We pray that you would fill us with your presence. We pray that we would be given your presence to overflowing. And we pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would transform our lives through your word. And we pray that we might become more and more like our Savior. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us as the word is proclaimed. And Lord, we ask that you, you would be lifted up, that you would be glorified. And we pray this in your glorious name. Amen. A year ago, today, if I was standing here on the first Sunday of the year and I began to reel off to you the various things that I thought was going to happen in the coming year of 2020, and you would listen to me talk about all the things that have happened this year, you would be able to leave this sanctuary and go, I knew that he was a false prophet. He shouldn't have tried it to begin with. But we all know what's happened in the past year. We all know of the disruption. We know of the isolation. We know of the illness. We know of the death. We know of the economic impact. We know of the turmoil that our nation has been in. We know of the election. We know of the outcome of this election and what has followed. We're in the middle of a trial. As a people of God, we're in the middle of a trial. And it's a trial that we're going through together. It's like all of us have gone through a hurricane that's lasted nine months and still got a ways to go. And the question is, what have we learned from this? What as believers have we truly learned from going through this time of the COVID virus? I'm not talking about means of coping with it. I'm not talking about the the practical aspects of, of how we have learned to adapt. I'm speaking about spiritually. How spiritually, what spiritually have we learned from these nine months? Have they been wasted? You know, if we go through a trial and we don't respond to it by faith and trusting in God's grace and growing from that trial, then that trial is wasted in our life. How are we benefiting how have we benefited? What have we learned from this trial? If there's anything we've learned, is that we must grow deeper in the Lord. This life changes suddenly. It changes suddenly in ways that we cannot even begin to forecast we find that the sand or the foundation that was under our feet becomes sand very quickly. And the only rock we have is Christ. The only lock, rock that will remain throughout eternity is the living God. And so the question is, how have we really learned from this? Are we growing deeper? And so what I'm doing for the month of January is a short series. It's called Growing Deeper in the Lord. And today I want us to talk about an area that certainly has been affected by the virus, and that is worship. But I also want us to look at growing deeper in Scripture through meditation next week. I want us to talk about praying without ceasing by growing in prayer. And then the following week I want us to talk about growing in fellowship with one another deeper. And then finally talking about the area of great need of growing in evangelism deeper in our lives. How can we grow deeper in worship? A.W. Tozer, who wrote much about worship, it seemed to be at the very center of all that Tozer wrote, he said this, We are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. He said, there is more healing in five minutes of true worship than five days of anything else. 
And then he said this. He said, I say the greatest tragedy in the world today is that God has made man in his image and made him to worship him, made him to play the harp of worship before the face of God day and night. But we have failed God and dropped the harp, and it lies voiceless at his feet. We do not need the writings of men. We do not need the writings of A.W. Tozer to tell us that worship is to be the priority of our life. The Scripture tells us that over and over again. If worship is to be our everlasting preoccupation, that which is always foremost in our mind, if there is more healing in five minutes of worship than five days in anything else, if worship truly is God's means of recreating us, then the question comes, why do we as Christians Allow the harp of worship to lie still at the feet of our God. That's a question. It's a question we need to ask ourselves. Why are we so preoccupied with almost everything else rather than being preoccupied with God himself? I want to ask five questions this morning as we pursue to worship God deeper. First question is this, do I believe in my heart that the reason I exist is to worship the living God? Do I believe in my heart that the very reason that I'm here, the very reason that I draw breath, is to worship the living God? Shorter Catechism answers the question, what is man's chief end? And it gives a very succinct and an incredibly profound answer. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Man's chief end is to glorify God, to worship God, and delight in Him, if you will, forever. Now, all men are worshipers. All women are worshipers. There's a reason for that. But we're all worshipers. Whether we're Christians or whether we're non-Christians, we're worshipers. The Samaritans and the Jews were both worshipers. The woman at the well talks to Jesus about their worship and where they worship. But they're both worshipers. Every temple in the world, every shrine, every religious text, other than the scripture itself, is a testimony that fallen man is a worshiper of the living God. Every growling denunciation of God, such as the so-called militant atheism, of our day is by its very denial of God a testimony to his existence. The first book that R.C. Sproul wrote after graduate school was entitled, If There Is No God, Why Are There Atheists? You think about that title for a minute. We are worshipers of something by our very nature. The nature in which we were made compels us to worship something. And whether you worship the true and living God or not, you worship something. And why is that the case? Because of all the creatures that God has made, the only one that we know for sure that was created in his image are human beings. We are made in God's image. As a result of that, we are by nature drawn to a God. It may not be the true and the living God, but we are drawn to a God. We are drawn to worship. So you ask the question, what of this worship? Well, this worship is intimacy with the God who has created us and the God who has redeemed us. It's only the Christian through Christ who can truly worship. You say, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, it answers so much. It truly answers so much. If the reason we were created was to worship and is to worship, is it no wonder that we feel empty or bored or purposeless with all of our activities and all of our amusements when we are first and foremost neglecting the very reason for which we were created? Is it any wonder that we're a culture where addictions are increasingly epidemic, 
and is not the ultimate cure for addiction worship? Is it any wonder when our Bible as Christians is left alone and our prayer life is lifeless and our attendance or our participation in corporate worship is sporadic at best, that our hungry hearts chase after what this culture offers? Worship answers so much. It answers so many questions. Second question is this. Do I believe in my heart that the living God is worthy of my worship? How wonderfully the Lord brought the worship service together. Connie had us sing this very point in one of the songs that we sang. Do we believe in our hearts that the living God is worthy of our worship? Do I personally believe in my heart that the living God is worthy of my worship? Before the virus hit, we we lived in an evangelical community where the value of worship was on decline. We live in an evangelical community today that when pollsters poll the Christian church, asking people for regular attendance, are you involved regularly in the life of the church? Do you know what a pollster now determines a regular involvement in church as? One time a month. That's what they see regular involvement in a church as. One time a month. George Barna, who is the George Gallup of Christians uh, polling, he has done studies since COVID has hit. And one of the things that he has found through extensive polling is that 32% of people who were regularly involved in church before the virus. So he's talking about one time, once a month. People who were regularly involved, from his definition, in church before COVID hit, 32% of them are no longer involved, either through the Internet or through worship on Sunday morning. 32% have simply dropped out. Why is that the case? Well, very often the reason for that is because worship, we see it as something that it's not. We see it as something that is about something that it's not really about. We see it differently than God sees it. When Sally and I had little ones, we had birthday parties for our children and you'd have a five-year-old birthday party, and planning a five-year-old birthday party is something. It's a production. Now, not when our children were five-year-old, but for many children today, when they have a five-year-old birthday party, it might possibly involve an inflatable ocean liner in their front yard. It involves weeks of trying to plan all that together, of getting cake and ice cream and various other things all together. It's a production. And then after it's over with, you have to get cake and ice cream off the walls, out of the carpet. You have to take weeks to encourage the dog to be friendly again. It takes weeks to make up with parents whose children came home crazed with their systems full of sugar and caffeine. And after it's over with, you sit down and you say to one another, six-year-old birthday party's not happening. We've been through fifth grade, five-year-old. We're not doing six-year-old. That's just too much. But a birthday party isn't about the parents. It's about the child. And we often approach worship in the same way. We come to worship and we ask the question, what am I getting out of it? We come to worship and we say, I didn't get much out of that. We come to worship and we say, I didn't learn anything today. We come to worship and say, I didn't like those songs that they sang. I didn't like the fact that the prayer was too long. I didn't like the fact they talked about money. So I'm not going back. I'm not going back very often. 
I've got other things to do with my time. But worship isn't about us. It's about God. If you want to ask a question about worship, here's the question to ask. You can ask this question on any given week to determine whether you go to worship or not. Is God worthy of my worship this Sunday? That's the only question. Is God worthy? Is God really worthy of my worship? Has he done enough that I should give him a nod this week? Has God accomplished these things for me? Has he answered these prayers? Is God really worship worthy of my worship? And you see how ludicrous that question is. But that's really the only question you can ask. He's always worthy of our worship. And he calls us to himself. The mark of the believer is that they're called into the worship of God. That's the changed heart. Is there a cure for placing ourselves before God in worship? Well, the answer to that is yes. And so here's a third question for you of deepening worship. And that question is, do I believe in my heart that relationship is more important than ritual? Do I believe in my heart that relationship is more important than ritual? How can we effectively worship corporately together? It will be by placing relationship before any ritual. The heart of turning our hearts toward worship is not turning our worship services into a Taylor Swift concert or a Justin Bieber concert, and I may be dating myself by even using those names. Nor is it in turning the worship service into a funeral service with an offering. The cure is not necessarily in how we do worship. It is the fact that in worship we meet the living God. That's the issue. The Pharisees of Christ's day were very much interested in ritual. They were constantly washing their hands. They had virtually obsession with it. They had steps taken on worship on the Sabbath day. How many paces can they walk on a Sabbath day? They would not touch certain people because certain people, they thought, made them unclean so that they could not worship God. And on and on it went. And Christ said one thing about these things, they're meaningless. They're meaningless. Christ counters in this passage and he says in verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And what that means is that we must worship God in spirit in our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. When we become a Christian... God draws us in our heart. As He changes our heart, He draws us to Himself in worship. The mark of the believer is that they're drawn to worship. They're drawn to private worship and devotion toward God, and they're drawn to public worship to worship with His people. You cannot find for me in Scripture, and I defy you to find that person in Scripture who is called to Christ and is not called to to the body of Christ. You cannot find that person in Scripture. You are called to Christ, and in being called to Christ, you are called to the body of Christ. And the apex of the body of Christ is the worship of the living God, is the worship of God through Christ. And that is scriptural. Is there any cure that turn us away from meaningless ritual to relationship, that would cause us to stop evaluating worship based upon ourselves and not what God would have us to do? Is there any cure to this? And the answer to that is yes, that we gain a vision of God. Because the more that we gain a vision of who God is, the more that we will be drawn to Him. You cannot truly know Christ and not worship Him. You cannot truly know Christ and not be drawn to worship Him. You simply do not know Him 
if you are not drawn into worship? Who is this God that we worship? How must we see him? Westminster Confession of Faith was written in, the six, was written in 1643, and it's one of the best expressions of who God is. It is a fallible document. It was written by men it's based on Scripture. If you looked at the confession, you would see that each of these things that are said by God are referenced in the Word of God. It is recognized, though, as one of the greatest theological definitions of God in writing. Listen to what the writers of the confession say. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, Hearts are passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and with all most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. This is the God whom we worship. And to know him is to be drawn to worship him. This type of God is one who repels the unbeliever. But it is one who draws the believer. And it is not a matter of ritual. It's a matter of relationship. I have worshipped in a converted pornographic theater in Tanzania, Africa. I have worshipped in a former underground fortified church in Kiev, Ukraine. I have worshipped in a 12th century church in England. I have worshipped in a southern country church that had a regular attendance of 12 because I preached there every Sunday. All of these churches had vastly different worship. But they met with God. And they worshiped the living God. All had vastly different style. All had vastly different music. And yet they met with the Lord and their hearts were filled with his awe and with his glory and with his greatness. If there is one goal that I have and one goal that Connie has, one goal as today as Kenny led the service, the one goal that we have in our music and everything that we do is that you will have a higher view of God so that you will be drawn to worship him. That is the ultimate goal. But where does this higher view of God originate? Well, here's the fourth question I want to ask. Do I believe in my heart that truth is more important than experience in worship? Do I believe in my heart that truth is more important than experience in worship? Every religion has religious experiences. Gandhi, who in his 1929 autobiography said, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Did you ever know that you were quoting Gandhi when you, would say some, when you say something like that? Gandhi, who was a Hindu, had religious experiences. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, had religious experiences. David Koresh, who unfortunately we know about, had religious experiences. All religions have religious experiences. The Samaritans. This woman at the well was a Samaritan. Had religious experiences. But they worshipped the wrong God. He t this lady says to Jesus, uh, she says, in verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where you ought to worship. You could see Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans worship, from Jacob's well. You can go to Jacob's well if you go to Israel. It's there. You can see Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans believed that only the first five books of the Bible were true. And they believed only Moses was the true prophet. And they worshipped the wrong God. 
They did not worship the God as he was fully revealed through the prophets. They did not worship the right God. Everyone apart from God himself working in our life has strange understanding of God. When you do evangelism today, it's an interesting thing. One of the things that when we do evangelism is that we need to ask a lot of questions before we begin to talk. And when you talk to people and you ask what they believe, it's really interesting to hear what they believe. They believe the Discovery Channel. They believe the Discovery Channel. They believe some self-help book that they have read. They believe some strange church that they may have grown up in, or not a church, something else. People believe, because people are worshipers, people believe something about God. And it is not the truth, it is error. And so whether it's the Samaritans, or the Hindus, or the Muslims, or the firewalkers of South Pacific, all of them have religious experiences. And they are very dedicated to those experiences, and they are very, very dedicated to their rituals. If you have ever been in a Muslim country, you would hope that you could have some way in the middle of the night pulling an electrical cord. Because if you are in a Muslim country, you will wake up between 4.30 and 5.30 to morning prayers that will sound like they are doing it outside the window of where you're staying. They are dedicated to what they believe but they are worshiping. It is through the Scripture alone that we gain who true God truly is. Listen to what Christ says. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It is through the Scripture alone that we know who God is. It is through the Scripture alone that we know how we should worship God. In the Reformed Church, it is called the regulative principle, and it means that we go to God's Word to understand what He would have us to do in worship. On Sunday mornings, we don't sit down and think about Sunday morning worship and think what we would really like to do this Sunday is that we would like to have the choir put on roller skates and roller skate through our sanctuary while they sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. That doesn't cross our minds. You know why it doesn't cross our minds? Because it's not found in Scripture. And quite honestly, we're not asked to use our creativity in the area of worship. We're called to go back to the Word of God over and over and over again and ask what God would have. How would He want to be worshipped? What does He say in His Word? It calls us to His Word. It calls us to sing hymns. It calls us to pray. It calls us to call ourselves into His presence. It calls us to meet corporately together on the first day of the week. All these things are aspects of God's Word as we worship Him. And then finally, here is the, first quest, the fifth question that we can answer this morning as we seek to grow deeper in worship. And that question is this, do I believe in my heart that God seeks my worship? Do I truly believe in my heart that God seeks my worship? Notice what it says in this passage Jesus says in verse 23, But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. The Holy Spirit works in our heart. He draws us to Himself and He draws us to worship. And so we say as Bernard of Clairvaux in the hymn, We taste Thee, O Thou living bread, and long to feast upon Thee still. We drink of thee the fountainhead and thirst our souls from thee to fill. You know, if God is seeking us to worship him, then it means that he misses us when we don't worship him. It means that he looks for us and we may not be there. 2 Chronicles 16 says, The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. 
He misses us if we do not worship. So let me ask you, what are you learning from this crisis that we're in? Are you growing deeper in worship? Would you consider even today committing your life, as it were, would you consider committing your life to having as your overwhelming preoccupation as a believer in Christ the worship of Him? Would you see corporate worship as the priority in your life? Would you see devotional time and private worship as the priority in your life? Would you commit yourself daily and weekly to the worship of God? It's the mark of the believer. Let's bow our heads in prayer. O oh, dear Lord, we have come, O oh Lord, to know Thee. We have come, O oh Lord, to taste Thee, O oh Lord, and know that You are good. We have come, O oh Lord, to bow before You. We have come to lift up our heart and our will and our mind to glorify your holy name. And Father, we pray that you would forgive us. Lord, our hearts are ashamed of our lack of desire for you. Our hearts are ashamed of our lack of longing for you. Our hearts are ashamed of not seeking your glory. Forgive us of our preoccupation with a thousand different things. Things that always pass in time. And forgive us of our lack of focus upon you who are eternal. You who last. You who are living. You who are the glorious God. Father, I pray for anyone here who may not know Christ. I pray that even as he spoke to the woman at the well, that he would speak to their hearts this morning. And Lord, they would know that everything else in life that they may seek is nothing compared to knowing him. That he is the one who fills our heart. That he is the one who forgives our sin. That he is the one who declares us righteous through trusting in him alone for our salvation. Oh Lord, even today I pray that they would turn from their sin and turn from themselves and their sin and turn to Christ alone to trust in Him in faith and to know that He truly, truly saves. And Lord, may we as a people of God be marked first and foremost by the fact that we worship You. And we pray this in Your name. May we stand for the benediction. And now may God's grace and his mercy and his peace be with us both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.